Great. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to the Friday early afternoon Health Equity Translational Social Science Lecture organized by the HETS research team and co-sponsored by the Center for Social Medicine's Langell Grand Round Series and the Walker Chair here at UCLA in the Department of Psychiatry. And it's a very special pleasure and honor for me today to introduce Dr. Ryan McNeil, who will be speaking about the cutting edge harm reduction services for vulnerable populations who use drugs in Vancouver, Canada, in our current moment of rapidly shifting, increasing toxic synthetic wholesale drug markets all across North America. Ryan is Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of General Medicine at Yale University, where he is the Director of Harm Reduction Research in Yale Medical School's program in addiction medicine. He hails from Canada with an interdisciplinary sciences PhD from the University of British Vancouver, British Columbia in Vancouver. <laughs> British Vancouver is still a colony. He is the recipient of numerous honors and grants supporting his innovative collaborative harm reduction um, work. Despite his youth, having received his PhD in 2013, he's already a foundationally critically innovative leader in the, in the field of harm reduction and a dynamo of energy. He's currently PI on three NIH NIDA grants and one Canadian Institute on Health grant, as well as co-investigator on no less than 13 additional Canadian and US public health grants, examining social, structural, and environmental forces affecting the upstream risk environments, including good versus bad policies, shifts in structural forces, and the multifaceted continuum of violence faced by vulnerable populations who use drugs on the streets. He's an amazingly productive scholar with 107 articles, most of them his first author. Um, along with two edited volumes and half a dozen book chapters. He, most importantly, he communicates his findings widely and accessibly as the co-creator and scientific lead of the multiple award-winning podcast called Crackdown, which he co-founded in 2019. And please do explore his, crack, his podcast, Crackdown's archive online, because it is a collaboration with people who use drugs and has been hailed as, quote, the podcast mo most likely to save lives. In short, Ryan is a young superstar deeply committed to collaborations in social justice intervention and harm reduction. And on a personal note, I thank you for flying into Los Angeles in the midst of a global warming heat wave rife with threats of catastrophic for forest fires because of winds from an unseasonable thunderstorm that, of course, hasn't arrived yet. And forgive me, Ryan, if this is inappropriate, but I secretly hope part of the motivation for your coming here today and staying through the weekend in this virus fire moment may be an interest in joining our intellectual community as a faculty member someday, but you should come in January when you're miserable. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, because that's when it's just gorgeously beautiful here because the dystopically utopian mega sprawl of Los Angeles has more people dying on its streets than any other US city. And we have a lot to learn from the harm reduction advances of Vancouver and the rest of the world uh, who treat their vulnerable populations slightly less cruelly than does Los Angeles. And members of the audience, you are also all invited to a little reception for Ryan after the talk at 2.30 PM in Semmel B8-225, which is the room across from the Pretty Fish Aquarium in the otherwise hideous foyer of the 760 Westwood Plaza entrance of the sprawling Semmel, sometimes called CHS building. Okay, Ryan, the floor is finally all yours. Take it away and let me just hand the computer over to you. Well, thank you because that's an altogether too kind um, introduction. Um, I am going to quickly share my screen, but first thank you all for, for joining today. Um, I'll be talking about work in, uh, we've been doing in Vancouver, Canada for really about more, slightly more than 10 years at this point. That's deeply important to me, both intellectually, but also in terms of the, the deep longstanding commitment to addressing health inequities among folks who use drugs that are very much driven by decisions made by people with power. So this is where I embarrassingly always try to figure out how to share my screen which is always more of a struggle than it is because I, there we go. 
Perfect. So thank you again all for joining. Um, so I'm going to do that awkward thing where this is hybrid. So I'll be looking kind of beyond the screen at the screen sometimes. So if I seem shifty, honestly, it's just because I'm managing the dual, the dual nature of this. Um, let's start with a bit of an anecdote from work I've been doing. So I've been doing work in Vancouver's downtown east side since uh, 2010 and really started ethnographic field work related to my PhD work in, in 2011, uh, partnered with the Vancouver a Network of Drug Users, a long-standing, established, and world-leading drug user organization that operates out of the downtown east side neighborhood in Vancouver and has had an incredible impact on drug policy locally nationally and internationally in terms of, quite frankly, breaking the law to do things that need to be done to keep people alive. And while they're operating as an organization, Vancouver, as many people joining this call will know, is a site of incredible innovation around harm reduction that we see specifically in relation to things like supervised consumption services and safe supply, which I'll be talking about today. And there was a very particular moment now, a little more than 10 years ago, where the case of Insight, the, the sanctioned supervised consumption facility in, in Vancouver had reached the Supreme Court after several people who used drugs had effectively sued the government for the purposes of keeping it open as it was under threat by a conservative government at that time who was weaponizing anything they could for the purposes of being punitive towards people who use drugs and undercutting efforts to implement harm reduction programming they really coalesced around a, a long-standing attack on this facility. It was deeply political, that mobilized police efforts in terms of, of criticism of, of the site and a, a variety of other techniques. And so September 30th rolled around and, you know, uh, of 2011, it was wonderful to see this, this banner unfurled because Insight won the case to keep the facility open. Now that day, I'm about three blocks from there um, at the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. You see here Hugh Lampkin and Kevin Yake, two past presidents of Bandu and longstanding drug user activists in the neighborhood. And I, I'm there that day on the day of this monumental Supreme Court decision that facilitates insight staying open and theoretically should have created a pathway for the expansion of supervised consumption services across Canada. And it, it was really a day like any other. Um, here, here I am, along with the folks accessing the site, about three blocks from Insight, taking a steady inflow of people throughout the day, going to Vandu because Insight was set up in a way that didn't meet their needs and that they couldn't access. And that's really the crux of so much of what I'm going to talk about today is in that evolution of harm reduction from a, a grassroots drug user led movement that often involves breaking the law to push forward with interventions that need to happen to keep people alive, we see this very peculiar thing often happen in, in public health where you have versions of harm reduction implemented that don't fully meet the needs of those who are rendered most structurally vulnerable by the arrangement of the state, by drug prohibition by policing strategies that render especially people of color who use drugs disproportionately vulnerable to harm, that reify so many of the, the structural inequities that render people vulnerable to harm. And within that context, it's a bit of an opportunity to push forward and think about, well, what next? And how can we locate these movements and these efforts to effectively have a harm reduction of of and for the people in a way that works, both in Canada, but also in the US at a particular moment where we're navigating the complexities and frankly, the, the really unfortunate moment of a recent veto of a supervised consumption bill in California. That's an incredible step back. But I, I think it really points to the way it's been raised by others of, we have to accept that harm reduction isn't going to come through official channels it almost always historically has come by people standing up and breaking laws that are unjust to keep people alive. So if that's an undercurrent that I, I'm going to return to, it really settles around the kind of three primary things that really animate so much of my work and how I think about this, which is first, 
what are the forces that are actually driving drug-related harm from the overdose crisis? How are drug user communities responding to this crisis? And very particularly in terms of mobilizing networks of mutual aid, social solidarity, and direct community activism. And finally, as these approaches are, are demonstrated to be successful and are picked up by the state, are implemented by public health programs, how are people challenging or resisting their limitations to have a harm reduction that better meets their needs? Um, I'll just briefly frame out the overdose crisis because I, I think it's particularly important just I am very much personally of the view that so much of pre-2015 doesn't really matter at this point when we're talking about the contemporary arrangement of the overdose crisis. There's, for me, so often pre-fentanyl and post-fentanyl at this point where we kind of mark that particular shift with the increase in synthetic opioids, rendering people disproportionately vulnerable to harm. Um, and I always think back to this quote from a paper of ours from a few years ago that really sums up someone talking about how this moment when things suddenly change, describing an overdose experience and fentanyl um, at an overdose prevention site that we were doing field work in. Um, so with heroin, you feel it coming on, you feel the intensity, you feel like you're going to puke, you know, because it keeps coming and you know, I, I'm going to go down overdose. Fentanyl, you're sitting there waiting for something. The next thing you know, there's an ambulance attendant there. It hits you like a Mack truck. You don't feel it, nothing. It's just boom, down. You get up and swear that you didn't even do your shot. You're looking for it. And for me, this quote often just captures the immediacy of that shift and how sudden it was for people as we experienced a wholesale change in, in the drug supply that amplified the risk associated with each drug use of that, that is even further complicated now as we're seeing a, a rise of new adulterants across so much of the supply in North America, where we're seeing things like xylazine, benzodiazepines, and other things in the supply that still further amplify the risk of overdose associated with any drug use around. So here, and it's slightly dated now, but I like how they use colors in this graph, so I always go to this one. Um, you know, we see that, that shift, that moment noted in 2015, where we have this rapid rise in, in synthetic uh, opioids, primarily fentanyl overdoses. This is happening in Canada over time, and we, we see this similarly reflected. And it's just, you know, within the context of media attention to prescription opioids that have always been much more kind of complex in terms of how framed, in terms of how they just relate to whiteness and how it's reflected and how we think about overdoses. It's fentanyl now, or it's fentanyl in combination with other drugs, increasingly stimulants, um, and it's just other. In the supply. That's that's this is the reality of, of what we're in right now. Um, and it's getting worse. I mean, as folks um, are aware, joining this, you know, more than 100,000 people are, are are dying every year in the U.S. Proportionally, a single a similar number of people are dying in Canada. And and rates in areas most affected are are incredibly high. Um, and within that context, it, it's important to recognize that the overdose ep epidemic, again, it, it continues to, to get worse as we see a, a growing number of adulterants in the supply. Um, the, some of the more recent data I've seen in, in Vancouver, uh, up to at any given time, more than 50% of illicit opioids are, are testing positive for benzodiazepines as we have this complex mixture of just really dangerous adulterants in the supply. Um, it's important to, to pause and note here that the overdose mortality rate among Black and Indigenous persons has surpassed that of white folks since the outset of the pandemic. We're similar, similarly seeing gross racial inequities in the distribution of overdose-related harms uh, across North America. And that's partly because, and I cannot impress this upon people enough, Overdose, like COVID, like HIV before it, it really reveals the social fissures in, in our society and, and increased vulnerability stems in part from the structural inequities that impact people. 
from higher rates of homelessness and housing instability on through to eviction to increased exposure to police, engaging with the criminal justice system, the whole host of social inequities that, that function in very real ways to structurally oppress very particularly people of color who use drugs are, are driving forces behind these, these inequities. And that too extends to really inaction in terms of how we're responding in ways that, that meet the need for tailored approaches that you know, recognize, for example, that people of color are dying disproportionately, very specifically also of polysubstance use related overdoses. And yet we've been very slow to meaningfully respond. I just wish to emphasize that. Um, to talk a little bit very specifically about the, the research context in Vancouver, for those who are joining and may not be familiar. Uh, Vancouver is a site of longstanding drug user activism, really following the, the formation of the drug user union Bandu, the Vancouver Radio for the Drug Users in the, the late 90s, in response to what at that time was a localized overdose crisis that was killing about a person a day in British Columbia, on through to uh, really an HIV crisis with rates. Um, blank on these numbers, but uh, uh, upwards of about a quarter of folks who use drugs um, in the downtown east side living with HIV during this period. Um, rates of hepatitis C being upwards of 80% among the injection drug using population. And so folks started to come together, catalyzed by uh, activists, uh, very specifically, we'll, we'll name drop Ann Livingston as a longstanding activist in the community and a co-founder of Vandu that brought people together and they started to organize. They started to <clears throat> engage in direct action. They started to, to open unsanctioned interventions and it really coalesced at that time around the opening of a supervised consumption site and their efforts alongside um, strategically and importantly placed allies across public health and politically, um, an emphasis on the city, by the city of a need for change, were critical in catalyzing the opening of, of Insight, which I mentioned earlier, North America's first supervised consumption site, which I'm not going to, to litigate or relitigate the, the evidence, the public health evidence around Insight or supervised consumption, but to say that from journals like The Lancet to the American Journal of Public Health, to JAMA, to the New England Journal, there's a, a robust, body uh, of research at this point demonstrating the incredible successes of supervised consumption services in preventing overdose death, the transmission of infectious diseases like HIV, and addressing a range of other drug-related harms, and then also facilitating people's access, greater access to medical care. Um, and in this particular moment, it's not particularly helpful to, to relitigate this evidence, which is to say, we, we know this. This is part of the frustration of now doing this work in the US of there's a constant relitigation of this evidence under this view that we need specifically American evidence. But I, I just wish to emphasize that these benefits have been documented across contexts at this point, and we need just accept them as clear cut benefits of this very helpful public health approach. Now, overdose rates in, in Vancouver, they went down following the opening of Insight. There were a series of other things that contributed to this so as well, including the scale up of medication for opioid use disorder, broader expansion of harm reduction programming. And then as mentioned, we hit this moment in 2014, 2015, when we started to see overdose rates spike and spike quite rapidly. Um, to the point where we were then losing about three people per day in the province during those early days. And, you know, I always remember that most concretely in terms of doing field work at that time for a study that we were doing on, um, we were doing field work for a, a study on evictions in the downtown east side. And, and really up until that time, people would occasionally die of an overdose and it would be a devastating moment. Um, and a moment of community mourning in many cases. And yet 
suddenly we're, we're doing this study that was enrolling people and then aiming to interview them a few months later and we just started to lose people. It, it was this moment of it becoming incredibly real because people that we, we knew, people that we were engaging with, people that we were following and seeing were now being lost to this drug supply shift that brought with it the randomness of, of each injecting event bringing amplified risk. Um, and so in April 2016, the, the province's uh, provincial medical officer declared a public health emergency due to the overdose crisis. Effectively, in those early stages, serving as a bit of a, a mechanism to facilitate data sharing among the various bodies involved in the overdose response, but they didn't effectively up, open up a broader range of interventional approaches, much to the concern of the community, given that what, what it was going through at that moment. And things got worse. And so activists and community organizers began to respond by opening an unsanctioned, uh, basically, Ann Livingston, who I mentioned earlier, another local activist, Sarah Blythe, opened uh, a tent in the downtown east side, off an alleyway that was unsanctioned, but was providing supervised consumption services. Because while Insight was operating in the community, it always had a series of limitations from capacity um, because basically it never would have had the number of booths to meet demand for supervised consumption services in, in that neighborhood. There were limitations on terms of who could go. If you couldn't self-inject, as an example, you couldn't go to AIDS. And up to 50% of the local drug using population would need assistance injecting during any six month period. So a very common common thing. It was also geographically centered in an area of the neighborhood that some people perceived as unsafe, particularly as it relates to patterns or understandings of gender violence in the neighborhood, and very specifically the, the targeting of um, women, uh, transgender or non-binary folks, and folks who, who may be living with a disability that further constrained access to the facility among a lot of people who, who needed and would benefit from access. And so given these limitations, Sarah and Anne opened a tent off an alleyway staffed by volunteers and funded through a GoFundMe campaign to expand access to supervised consumption services. Other groups like Vandu were leveraging the, the meager amounts of money that they were being given by the local health authority to scale up programming that they could provide yet we're hamstrung by those very organizations from doing what's needed. So we were spending time with Vandu during that period out in alleyways, and they were going around with effectively an alley patrol to Narcan people or administering a lock zone if someone went down with an overdose. And yet they were explicitly told that they couldn't so much as have, as have something that could be interpreted as a surface that someone could use for the purposes of doing an injection because they weren't being permitted to, to operate any form of supervised consumption service by the local health authority at that time. And this too fell approximately two years after that unsanctioned site that they've been operating that I, I spent time, so much time at during my PhD was shut down by the local health authority, um, which remains one of the more personally and professionally devastating moments of me in my career, frankly. Um, out of concern that they would likely jeopardize other other programming being offered by by the local health authority. So this this tension is happening where people are acting as best they can within the context of, of constraints. But to put it bluntly, shit's getting bad, and then winter's coming. Um, and I. It's almost laughable to think about winter coming to Vancouver because, I mean, if anybody's that familiar with the geography, it's mostly like a rainy winter. But proper winter was coming that year. It was going to snow. And when Vancouver experiences snow, it shuts down. It's like a deep, heavy slush that people can't get around in. And the city just effectively ceases to function. The sidewalks ice over. It's treacherous to get around. And so snow was coming. And, you know, a colleague that I, I told about parts of this work with was sitting in a, a meeting at, at Vandu in their space in the downtown east side when they effectively got a call um, that I believe directly came from the, the then health minister, Terry Lake, 
to effectively green light them opening a, an overdose prevention site within their facility. And very quickly, the emergency order that had previously been made was leveraged to authorize the opening of these sites outside of what was a very onerous federal approval process at that time that took months and the, I mean, the documents required stacked almost a foot high in some cases, if you, you literally stacked them. And so quickly in the downtown east side, this very small, approximately 10, 10 block neighborhood, a number of sites opened up, staffed primarily by people who use drugs and, and other care workers for the purposes of immediately scaling up access. So this white dot is where the tent that I mentioned was located. That black dot is inside the sanctioned facility. And all of these other dots that you see are overdose prevention sites that effectively rapidly opened over the course of a week in December 20, um, six, 2016, as winter was, was beginning to hit. And so these sites and modeling work done by the DC Center for Disease Control has demonstrated were instrumental in, in saving hundreds of lives, have effectively been in operation since they've had other programming mapped onto them. They are, in many cases, a uh, what we can understand to be an incredible public health success. And yet people are still dying. More people are dying now than have ever died of overdose in, in Vancouver and in British Columbia, which is now seeing approximately six people die every day because the drug supply is that toxic and so much has changed, especially since the, the outset of the COVID pandemic, where the immediate shock experience the drug supply has seen huge and consistent swings in fentanyl potency that you can effectively map overdose deaths onto that has seen new adulterants and very specifically atazolam and other illicit benzodiazepines enter the supply in ways that increase people's likelihood of experiencing severe complications and death. And the interesting thing that I will get to methods and findings shortly that I, I think is worth thinking about is even as early as 2016, 2017, folks who use drugs in the community were demanding more. More than overdose prevention sites, more than places where they could go to use safely and have someone bring them back if they overdose, but for the tools that they needed to prevent overdoses themselves. And that coalesced very quickly around a large scale movement for safe supply, which put best in this concept document by the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs is framed as a legal and regulated supply of drugs with mind body altering properties that traditionally have been accessible only through the illicit drug market. Drugs included are opioids like heroin, stimulants such as cocaine and crystal methamphetamine, hallucinogens such as MDMA and LSD and marijuana. We're talking about access to drugs that are regulated, that are consistent, that are safer than what's available in the illicit supply right now. And so a number of models have been promoted, suggested from this piece we worked on around the, the idea of using a compassion club model, similar to what's happened with cannabis for the distribution of heroin and other drugs, to bringing this up as a larger concern that should be pursued from an emphasis on ensuring that we include stimulants, given risks of associated with adulterated stimulants and the challenges in managing drug use in the context of prohibition, and spotlighting how this is particularly important in the context of COVID, given the intersections or syndemics of COVID, overdose risk, and other infectious diseases among folks who use drugs. And that we could even see this as a way to approach drugs that could be reparative in the context of the drug war by facilitating pathways for the, the distribution of safer drugs that can remedy some of the harms that countries that have been targeted very specifically by the US as part of drug control efforts 
to effectively be helpful to them by recognizing routes to, to bring safer drugs into a legal regulated market. And so really beginning in 20, late 2018, 2019, we started to see some experimentation happening with small pilot projects being implemented to take up the idea of safe supply. There's a shot from an overdose prevention site, the Molson, and you'll see at the back of the room is a nursing station through that window. They were effectively implemented a program where people could be dispensed hydromorphone or Dilaudid as it's commonly known um, several times a day at different intervals for use on site, either via injecting or any other route of transmission that a person would, would want for. So effectively access to drugs that were safer than could be accessed elsewhere. In the context of COVID, we saw a, a very immediate effort to expand through the implementation of new guidelines or a guidance document, access to safer drugs for people that included hydromorphone, but also included dextro, amphetamine and methylphenidate to support people who use stimulants, given concerns about both increased toxicity in the supply since the outset of COVID, but also to support people in the need to, to isolate or quarantine following a COVID exposure. Some folks may be familiar with this. There was a push toward a, even a lower threshold of Dilaudid or hydromorphone distribution than the, the one at the OPS, where there effectively are now a number of people on a pilot for vending machines that take your hand on the screen and you're dispensed hydromorphone a number of times a day. Um, and I think most excitingly, and we'll cycle back to this at the end, the, Drug User Liberation Front, a local drug user organization um, that came together really through, through COVID and just before to begin effectively sourcing drugs through the dark web, buying them with cryptocurrency, testing them to ensure that there's no adulterants, and distributing drugs first as direct action to demonstrate that there are ways to support people in using safer and limiting their, their exposure to the supply. And finally, to running a, a very small scale, effectively unfunded pilot right now to, to demonstrate the feasibility of this approach. And so this is effectively the backdrop against which I, I've really been doing work for the last decade to understand how we can intervene and support people. And very particularly noting that so much of this work has been driven by drug user activists effectively just pushing forward because they need to and they need to keep people alive. And so this broader program of research that I've been leading has been supported by um, a number of different interlocking grants that I've, I've led over the years, funded by the National Institutes of Health, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Vancouver Foundation. Uh, we've got some money from the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council. And we're, we're very fortunate to be able to do this work in close partnership uh, with drug user led and other peer based organizations and to really take direction from them as to what needs to be done. Often coming to evaluate or look at programs um, at request when something new is being implemented that we, we need to understand and generate evidence for, about for the purposes of informal policy discussion. And so I won't list all the groups, but just to say I sitting here miss all of them deeply and are absolutely instrumental in addressing the, the severe burden of the overdose crisis in Vancouver. Now, part of this also too involves a commitment, as mentioned, to harness that evidence for the purposes of, of translating findings into tangible impacts for people through a combination of doing work that's aligned with or supports community advocacy efforts, but also often brings in health professionals to bring them along in terms of these approaches. It engages legal advocates because we sometimes threaten people with lawsuits, um, or that mobilizes the various tools that we can and that are available to us for the purposes of, of bringing approaches 
And so this broader program of work has involved ongoing ethnographic field work dating back to 2010, first primarily by myself, but now by a much larger team of, of students, trainees, and, and staff working through these various grants. Um, and has involved uh, qualitative interviews with, and I, I totaled this up for this talk, more than 500 unique people who use drugs recruited um, in connection with scale-led harm reduction organization, public health and addiction treatment program, and through peer outreach by our, our research assistants with lived experience in, in the downtown side. And so finally, one thing that we've kind of constantly tried to do through this work is to recognize that, that the burden of drug-related harms are different and that very specifically um, to lend an intersectional approach, recognizing that the intersection of characteristics like race and gender and age and sexuality and ability and so much more intersect with broader social structural concerns in different ways to render certain people more vulnerable to harm in any different context, but also frame the possibilities of intervention given the parameters of how programs often operate. So to harken back to the example of assisted injection and that being a barrier to, to accessing insight um, among folks who, who inject, those were also disproportionately um, women. They, they were disproportionately people with disability. And, and so it's important to, in, in this work, be cognizant of, of these dynamics and frame how people can engage with intervention touch on some high level findings from this broader program of work. So first is to emphasize the rapid scale up of overdose prevention sites, harness community expertise and social solidarity to expand access to life-saving um, services and mitigate gaps in local harm reduction uh, programming to enhance equity in the overdose response. So during this period, and I mean, really still, um, you know, certain folks, very specifically indigenous folks um, have been incredibly underserved by harm reduction programming. And this organic community response that was primarily led by people who use drugs um, that reflected the dynamics of the local drug user community was instrumental in, in facilitating access. But also people weren't going to stand by many of the barriers that had prevented people from accessing other programs. So these sites, I mean, it was kind of like this hush, hush, we'll talk about it, but we won't talk about it, all immediately started doing assisted injection, where peers and volunteers who were working there, who were often natural injectors within the community and had longstanding access to administering injections, recognized how critical it was to do that in the context, especially of the crisis, to provide access to, to services for people, and a, address effectively a structural inequity in how services had been delivered up to that point. Um, people also emphasized that shifting the approach to better bring in people who use drugs as leaders effectively made the spaces more relatable and minimized barriers to access. Um, here's a participant we had that kind of put it like this. So I'd open up more to the staff at the OPS, this peer-driven site run by folks who use drugs, um, and more to the people that are either previous users or current users and someone who's like a professional doctor, who's maybe never used in their life because their opinions and their outlooks on things, in my opinion, aren't really right. Because if you haven't experienced it, you've never been a part of it, you can't fully, you can, you'll never fully understand it. And that's a consistent sentiment that we saw expressed across these sites where it was absolutely critical that they were being run and driven by, by folks who use drugs. Um, this was also seen as something that would, would facilitate access, particularly for people who didn't see themselves reflected in, in other harm reduction programming, very specifically indigenous folks engaged in oral. Um, one participant put it, I don't think there's much judgment made at the OPS, like at which they felt at the, the sanctioned site insight. I felt a little bit of judgment because those like nurses, right? 
and I was the only native in, or indigenous person. And, and so people seeing themselves reflected in the sites, having opportunities for leadership, having opportunities to engage in mutual aid and social solidarity in the delivery of harm reduction programming is instrumental in facilitating success. So too was providing assisted injections, something that addressed these inequities that exist. And I won't read this full quote, because I'm gonna run long as I always do, and it's a bit lengthy, but it's simply to emphasize that providing opportunities for people to get help was critical in facilitating access, often for those who are rendered most vulnerable by, you know, in this case, trans misogyny, by structural racism, by things that constrain their opportunities to navigate their drug use education. Now, it was clear very early on and continues to be the case, these sites were constrained or at least operated in tension with social structural conditions that stemmed from the ongoing structural oppression of people who use drugs, but also the neoliberalization of public health that we very specifically see through longstanding disinvestment and the shifting of tasks and opportunities to run programs to people who use drugs, but without adequate support or recognition of them as professional people, critical in, in driving forward programming and occupying a lead role in response. And so one of the more immediate ways in which we saw this was through policing. Um, and this work that we're doing, doing field work and interviews at the overdose prevention sites where it was common to see police parked outside. And that this would function as a barrier toward people accessing the site. So a participant frames it out. There's certain areas you don't want to really be uh, there because the cops will drive up and down and you never know what they're going to say or do. It's mostly the hundred blocks. So this is kind of the center of the downtown east side drug scene. Um, but they, they do circle around pretty well all over the downtown east side. Um, but yeah, mostly in that area, there's a heavier presence in that area. And so we would routinely document as part of our field work, our circling up the alleyways around or adjacent to sites and people would clear out because it would run the risk of an engagement with police, with a, a police force that has a, a longstanding documented reputation of effectively parting people who use drugs and especially indigenous folks who use drugs, exceptionally high rates of seizing drugs, pushing people into situations where they have to either replace income in high risk ways or, or work to secure drugs in different ways that bring with it incredible risk or push them into situations where they might be in higher, higher risk injection, injection settings or situations. And these concerns were also, you know, made apparent in people's concerns about gentrification in the neighborhood, because one of the interesting things in doing this work is we saw an incredible spike in calls to police from primarily, you know, really upper middle income people who were moving into the downtown east side into condo buildings and calling police on people in a pretty, pretty regular way. Um, now, one of the other things, as I mentioned, that we saw is we saw the shifting of, you know, the opportunity, but also the burden of leading the crisis response to people who use drugs, but without adequate pay, without adequate support. And while there were all these structural um, forces that really framed out people's ability to, to, to be engaged and to do the work. Um, this first quote, which I won't read in the interest of time, but just to emphasize, so these sites were staffed primarily by people who use drugs, working and doing short shifts for which they received stipends, in part because there were limitations placed on how much money they could earn if they were also receiving social assistance. And so one of the things that would happen is people would be at risk of having other benefits clawed back if they effectively earned above a certain point. And given that things like the, the shelter allowances for people living in social assistance um, and other benefits are far below that which one needs to survive 
really live in Vancouver, it, it really made it impossible for people to be employed. Still further, one of the things that, that complicated this is the people didn't have supports. They couldn't live and make an income doing the work. They were burdened by the, the complexities of, of, of working in the sites while also having so many people in their life affected and dying. Um, the people were burning out constantly and cycling in and out of this work. And in, in many cases, leaving the work and then themselves dying of overdose um, because of the impacts that it would have on them as a community. Now, all of this centers on if overdose prevention sites are a critical response in keeping people alive, they're really response sites where you're preventing them. But you're not preventing overdose in many cases because the supply is toxic. And so what we've really seen as part of this broader movement to keep people alive is this push for safe supply through community activism, through direct action, and then these small pilot programs that were first operated, and then the expansion through the guidelines that facilitate access to prescriptions through physicians during the pandemic. And what we've found consistently in the various safe supply programs that we've looked at that have distributed drugs to people is that people are highly motivated to access alternatives to illicit drug supply. And they, they want access to things that are safer as best as they can do because people are concerned about reducing their exposure to, to fentanyl and other adults. I mean, it, it seems basic, but it's something we keep coming back to in this work because it needs to be re-emphasized is whatever it is that a person prefers using, they want access to something that's regulated to keep themselves safe. Um, a quote from one of our, our participants really emphasized that. I don't. So this is uh, work that we were doing looking at the program where they were distributing hydromorphone through this overdose prevention site where this person emphasizes, I don't think anybody's overdosing on the safe supply program. You know, there's a standard drugs there. You know what you're getting when you get this. Here, if you get it on the corner, you don't know what you're getting. You think you might, you don't. Um, this person didn't engage with drug checking programs, checking everything that's been coming in. And the supply is what? You never know what's going to be in it. And so one of the things that we found in terms of the, the various safer supply programs and distributed safer drugs is that they allow people to be safe, they help people be safer, but it also helps people effectively not have to do all of the other things that they need to do to be able to hustle the buy drug. So people are just generally healthier and have a better quality of life because you've removed the big thing under drug prohibition that frames out how they engage while also being responsive to the structural inequalities that frame out their opportunities and their ability to survive. Yet with that said, these have been implemented almost solely through medicalized approaches that constrain the effectiveness of our ability to do safe supply in a way that aligns with what people need, leading to a misalignment between these interventions and the underpinning philosophy, which is to provide safer access to regulated drugs. And so, really to kind of sum up some findings, we see this expressed as the drugs not being what people want, them having different effects, them being primarily oriented toward managing withdrawal or mitigating withdrawal and not actually identifying or recognizing and centering that pleasure is also a part of drug use. That this is much more complex than and need be treated in different ways than as a strictly medical use. Um, we mentioned we do have a podcast that covers all of this in much greater depth, which I would encourage people to look at, and you can get it all of the places you get your podcasts. And just to cycle back. So if supervised consumption and the effort to, to push it, it began as a social movement that involved people breaking the law and opening unsanctioned interventions in the context of the social cost of not doing this being too high, and it creating a pathway for these to happen because they need. Similarly, we're now seeing this, and we're at a similar moment to what I feel we were 15 years ago around supervised consumption, where the efforts of groups like the Drug User Liberation Front to provide and source safer drugs for people are critical in facilitating that access um, in ways that are aligned with what people want. And to, just to put a pin in this, and I'd be happy to take questions in the bit of time that we have left, which is to say, harm reduction has been driven by movements of people who use drugs for as long as there's been harm reduction. 
And yet our inability to fully respond, support, and lift up people to do the things that they, they need to do to keep their communities alive, because we pursue approaches that are half measures, that operate within medicalized frameworks, that don't recognize the, the incredible opportunities that we have to support and build off the strengths of people who use drugs are what limit us. And if we're going to be concerned with doing this in a meaningful way, we need to catalyze community organizing in ways that center communities of folks who use drugs and drug user activists and provide them with the tools, support, and as much as we can, the cover to do what's needed to keep people alive in this moment of normalized mass death that I pray that we get out of. Thank you. So we have, we have time for questions. And thank you very much. That was um, that was that was really interesting, uh, pushing pushing the envelope of of harm reduction. I, I was wondering, I'll just we have a um, a lot of people have, um, attended today, and so we'll be taking the, the, the we'll be taking questions through the chat. Um, and I'll just open up with um, what has been the effect of Van, of uh, Vancouver with respect to um, with, with respect to the rest of of uh, of, of of Canada, um, you know where are where, where are other innovative um, harm reduction interventions taking place, and where are they failing throughout Canada? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we see a lot of really interesting approaches and innovations being driven by different groups across the country in different cities like Toronto. There's fascinating work happening around drug checking, around safer supply, around supervised consumption sites. We've seen a rapid scale up of different approaches, but they've been consistently hamstrung by government. Um, and specifically, a reaction against harm reduction that's very much happening in this moment of like populist right wing movements that consistently punch down and attack people who use drugs and scapegoat them to structural failures. And so we've seen this probably most acutely in the province of Alberta, where we've seen them shut down sites. That have that, that people have made political decisions consistently that devalue and actively work to frankly kill people who use drugs. And so much as we see regressive action against harm reduction happening in the US, I'm thinking about the, the backlash against the possibility of SAMHSA grants being used to, to provide uh, safer smoking supplies from this past spring. You know, we see the exact same thing happening in Canada. And I think we should be deeply concerned and actively figuring out within our own positions as part of our broader movements that we're connected to, what we can actually tangibly do to counter that now. Because I mean, I, I, I frankly fear a reckoning is coming with so much of this. So there's a, there's a question from from Robert Guerra, um, um, what impact do you think the safe consumption site in New York um, will have on efforts in the U.S.? You mentioned that um, that our that the governor of California just um, a couple of weeks ago vetoed uh, the the um, the safe injection site here in Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely critical to demonstrate this can be done. It's done in a setting where they, I mean, they haven't been shut down yet, and it's been almost a year. And it's creating a, because America seems to need this, an American evidence base that these things work. And, you know, I think that in itself is helpful, but frankly, we, we need the Biden administration to maybe be like just a smidgen braver and actually just clarify and make a statement that these sites can open and operate. Because we, you know, we actually need that to happen. You can't wait for public opinion to be there that we need to, to do harm reduction support people who use drugs. We need to take action to keep people alive. And you know, that involves taking the if it's a political risk, take it, but like let's let leadership drive drive this in the spaces where it can, because other otherwise you're just failing folks. 
um, th there's a couple of people that asked about um, about about the podcast. Just to, it's in the it's in the chat, but in case uh, you're not seeing your chat, it's called Crackdown. Um, and um, th there's a there's a question from Jeremy uh, Calicum on on the term people who use drugs um, as a broad term, and, and um, you know what are the pros and cons of its of its openness and so forth. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic point, Jeremy. So Jeremy basically raises that, and I apologize if I mischaracterize this, I'm gonna try to be fast. Um, that, that the term people who use drugs uh, can be a little bit problematic in that it, it can often be seen as including people who, who haven't been significantly impacted by the, the drug war and can effectively co-opt an important voice. I agree. And I think part of what needs to happen is uh, as part of movements that, they actively need to center people who've been most effective because frankly, that doesn't always happen. And I, I find frankly, you especially see that in US contexts where a lot of the folks who get elevated, especially by official sources are frankly folks who haven't had to deal with a lot of the interlocking structural oppressions that folks who use drugs deal with. I mean, I, I swear you can't, get by an event being put on by a government in, in the US without the, the drug user representative or activist that they try to engage, ultimately being like a white dude in false step or something. I, I think part of what we need to do is actively work with, identify and provide opportunities for people um, that, that challenge that, that, that work to center the, the voices of the people who've been most impacted. And I, I like that the term that you use, drug war survivors here, because that, you know, a group of drug war survivors for years. And I think it's always been one of the best ways to put it. Well, um, uh, on that note, I want to re-invite everyone um, to come uh, in the next half hour here to the uh, to the, our our to the eight to twenty five, which is um, technically seven sixty Westgate. Plaza, and it, it, there's a courtyard, um, and the, the, there's an there's an electric door that opens, and and we're right across from the fish, the the pretty um, fish aquarium, and um, and thank you um, again, Ryan, uh, and I guess uh, on some note, uh, it, it's the uh, it's the the correction surviving population that we have here in the United States that's so humongous and, and so fortunate. Okay, thank you very much. And take care, everybody. Thank you.